So I think we'll go ahead and get started. I'll ask if you're not talking, if you wouldn't mind muting yourself. Um, I do have master control, so if I have to, I'll go ahead and mute you, but I certainly want people to be able to ask questions. Um, I know that most of us at this point are pretty familiar with the mute and unmute capability of Zoom. Um, so um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our sponsor for this morning, Topside Federal Credit Union. We are pleased to be joined um, by Laura Gilchrist. So Laura, take it away. Thank you so much, Kim. Good morning, everyone. Um, we love um, supporting FAR and um, we just like making sure that everyone is aware of the relationship that FAR members do have with Topside Federal Credit Union. You are all eligible to be members, be part of our family. And um, we, do, uh, we do have a spot on the showcase. So I hope um, all of you will go onto our showcase and view our video that we have and find out what our scavenger word is so that you can win a great gift on the FAR showcase. And also there is instructions on there on how you can all go online and start your membership too. Um, I encourage all of you to please go to our website, our topsidefcu.org, and just see all the amazing products and services that we have to offer you and your whole family. So if anyone is ever going to need to buy a car, get a credit card, have a personal loan, or just want to save or do everything online at no charge because we are a credit union, please, I encourage you to go online and check out our website. So enjoy your class today. I look forward to seeing all of you out in public when we're allowed to do that. But um, I know Zoom is great for now. So thank you so much, Kim, for letting me be on. And please, everyone, go and check out our website and that showcase video. Thank you, Laura. And for anybody who does not know what Laura's talking about in the showcase, tomorrow is our sort of replacement for the FAR Expo. Uh, most of you, if you've been around for a long time, will know the third week of September, we always do our big expo over at the Expo Center. Um, obviously that cannot happen this year. So we have shifted to a totally virtual platform. There is still time to sign up and register. We have a great slate of classes for credit in the morning. We're having a contracts class. We're having a um, legal hotline Q and A, which I'm really excited about. Um, we're doing a class with Bright. We have a great session that's not for CE credit, but a great session with Dr. Lisa Sturdivant, who's the chief economist for the Virginia Realtors. Um, and then the highlight of the day really is being able to interact with those vendors. I know that all of you are incredibly busy right now. The market is hot, hot, hot. Um, so go check out vendors, um, go chat with some lenders and title folks. We've got a lot of great opportunities and it's all through an app. So it's all powered right through your phone. It's really, really easy. You download the app on your phone and you just poke around into different vendors, um, booths, if you will. And um, I think a lot of folks have, like Laura said, some great prizes to give away. Uh, mm -hmm. So go check them out, have some fun. Um, we're also giving away prizes for people who engage on the app. We have a leaderboard of people who do lots of engagements and we've got um, some prizes on our side as well. So if you wanna learn more, just head to the FAR website. We have a whole page dedicated to the FAR Fair, but you can always navigate to the calendar and go ahead and sign up for classes. We're gonna have the opportunity to do classes through Zoom, just like you always have done. And then also the opportunity to watch some classes through um, through the app if you're not necessarily interested in credit but want to get the information. So we've got lots of options. So Laura, thank you so much for being with us this morning. I'll go ahead and turn that screen share off so that we can move on to the main event. Let's see, I saw D. Smith and company from the Central Virginia Housing Coalition. Um, if, it, if anybody wants to change their screen to make it easier to see the speakers, you can just go up to your right corner and click speaker view and that will give you the big screen for whoever's talking at the time. Um, so again, Dee Smith and other folks from the Central Virginia Housing Coalition, thank you for joining us this morning. This group felt that it was very important to have this meeting um, in light of the changes to the source of income rules. We want property managers and property owners to be comfortable with the Housing Choice Voucher Program, um, to understand um, the process for inspections. I know that was a concern for a lot of folks is what do we do if we have a property and the inspections are taking a long time. And really, we just wanted to try to foster this relationship with CVHC so that our folks feel comfortable to say, yes, I saw an event, I listened to them, now I have a name and a number of someone I can call if I have questions. Um, so Dee, I'll turn it over to you and your crew to give us sort of an overview of, first of all, what CVHC does, because I'm sure some people are not familiar, um, and then specifically about the Housing Choice Voucher Program. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Hello? Okay. I, think I can hear um, you. 
If anybody okay. has any issues with sound, just either pop it in the chat or just unmute yourself and let us know and we'll try to make it. Uh, Central Virginia Housing Co Coalition has been an organization since 1988. Um, we're a small nonprofit. Um, in addition to administering the Housing Choice Voucher Program for all of Planning District 16 and Fauquier County, um, including some of Culpeper. Uh, we also have a property management department. We have affordable housing units that we rent out. Um, we also have um, some emergency assistance funds to help with people that are getting behind in their rent. Um, Obviously, those funds are not unlimited, and there's an application process. Um, in addition to that, we have an active housing counseling department. All housing counseling services provided by our housing counseling department are free of charge. We uh, also provide the homeowner education class, which, as you all know, in recent history, because of COVID, things have been a little bit Hinky and most of the clients have had to go to Virginia Housing uh, online to get that. Um, and that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Uh, we spend most of our organizational life at 208 Hudgens Road. We just recently moved to 2300 Charles Street um, after renovating an, an older medical building uh, here in downtown to make it a lot easier for our clients. Um, to give you an overview of the Housing Choice Voucher Department, I have the department director, Ms. Betty Newberry, with me, and also our property manager, um, who, as you probably well imagine, we do have some voucher recipients in our organizational um, owned property. So she also has some experience with us, but I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Newberry for an overview, and then uh, perhaps you all can ask some questions. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm not sure uh, how much anybody is familiar with the voucher program, but it is actually under HUD, um, Housing and Urban, Urban Development. Um, the premise behind the program is to give low to zero income families the opportunity to uh, move out of high poverty, high minority areas uh, so that they have uh, better opportunities for better schools, um, jobs, et cetera. Um, the participants pay 30% of their adjusted monthly income towards their rent, less the utility allowance. The utility allowance is actually a worksheet that we complete uh, based on the housing type. Um, this is an additional deduction from the rent that a participant would pay. Um, now, I, I do recognize some of the names up here on the board as realtors that we do deal with. Um, so I'm not really sure exactly whatever, what it is that everybody needs to know, but uh, there is a, um, a process basically. Um, when a participant wants to move, they do have to give a written notice to us based on the terms of the lease. Um, if it's a 30 day, 60 day, they're issued a paper voucher, which is basically a permission slip for them to, um, to relocate or move to another unit. They're also given paperwork to give to a prospective landlord. That paperwork actually gives us information about the unit so that we can determine that the unit itself is eligible for the program and that the participant is eligible for that unit. Now, um, just because the unit may be um, a rentable property does not necessarily mean that it is going to fall under HUD's guidelines. We do an, an initial inspection. Um, HUD has set forth certain things that, that do have to be in place for a participant to rent um, a unit from a particular landlord. And I guess now is a good time to say the difference between uh, public housing and the Housing Choice Voucher Program, with a voucher, the participant can live basically wherever they can find a landlord that is willing to rent. Whereas public housing is more or less like a building, you may have heard like projects or project-based. Um, we're actually more um, tenant-based than uh, public housing. So again, the, the participants do have the opportunity to live wherever they choose to live as long as they do have a landlord that is willing to rent that property. Once the, um, the unit is inspected and passes the inspection, 
Um, of course, we do try to avoid paying um, dual subsidies on any participants behalf. So we do try to encourage moves closer to the end of the month. Um, and, but normally the, uh, the move in date is between the tenant and the landlord. And again, once we have all the, the paperwork in play, then we can determine what portion, if any, that the, uh, the tenant would be paying. Um, a lot of our participants do have a portion of rent to pay. Uh, the participants are also 100% responsible for their security deposit. They, the, the participants actually have to recertify their eligibility for the program once a year. And that date is not always going to coincide with the lease or the recertification needed by some of the uh, the complexes in the area that do their own recertifications. So we had a question in the chat that says, can you discuss renewals and explain the 60 day notice for renewals? What is the process or rules for property managers to take when processing renewals? Okay, um, as far as a renewal goes, especially if there is a rent increase, HUD requires a 60 day notice from the landlord uh, to our agency in order to, pro to process that, uh, that increase. Um, we in turn have to give the tenant a 30 day notice if their, if their rent portion is going to increase because of the increase requested by the landlord for the contract rent. So we can either use a new lease or we can just go with a renewal. A lot of complexes actually just send out a, a lease renewal notice that states that they're renewing for either 30 days, 60 days, a month to month or whatever. Um, and again, HUD is the one that says we have to have that 60 days in advance. So for example, if we were to receive a, a rent increase today with this being September, um, we would actually count November, let's see, I'm sorry, we're in September, so it'd be October, November, the rent increase per HUD's policy would not be able to take effect until December 1st. So a follow-up question to that is, do the rent increases usually get approved? As long as we can determine that the rent that they are requesting is reasonable, um, then yes, they are approved. And being reasonable means um, that we have, we have been able to locate three other comparable properties that um, are basically the same size, same bedroom count, built around the same time period, same type of unit, same bedroom count. If we can find three other comparable units that are within $100 of the requested contract rent, we were able to approve that. If we can't find the comps, then we normally uh, defer back to the landlords, to give them the opportunity to supply them to us. So we're not realtors, so we don't have the MRIS to look at. We're basically looking at Zillow or um, the Social Serve actually has a, uh, a what they call a rent comp tool that we go in. But, Unfortunately there, if landlords are not listing their properties there, we can't see them. So usually we actually revert back to Zillow. So I, I saw two follow-up questions from, from Dawn and Leanne. So if I don't answer your question, please ladies pipe in. Um, would you say that it's a best practice if, you ha if you're representing a property owner who does have a rent increase to include proactively at the beginning those comparables? Um, if they choose to do so, by all means they can. We do have to verify that the information submitted is um, within HUD's, or I should say in this case, um, Virginia Housing's uh, specifications for uh, what they consider rent reasonableness. Leanne, Don, does that answer your question? I did have sort of a follow-up. Um, from another one that says, I've noticed that a lot of rentals that are accepting rental vouchers often have higher rents than like homes. Um, do they, they get rented at these higher rents? So who is doing the actual comps? I'm not sure I understand the question. We, we actually pull comps based on the rent that the landlord is requesting. Where the rents that are being requested are coming from, I really have no answer to that. I, I don't know. Um, we normally recommend that, um, especially for new landlords, um, you know, single family homes, independent landlords, um, that they're looking at the fair market rents for the area to base those rents on. Um, I really don't know whether the price or the cost of the voucher drives the rental market or vice versa, but I do know that the uh, vouchers are based on fair market rents and usually uh, Virginia housing uh, whatever the fair market rent is, they increase that by, uh, well, it's basically 110% of fair market rent is the amount of the voucher. 
um, with a voucher, um, <clears throat> excuse me, for example, you may have a voucher, and we'll just use round numbers to keep it easy. Your voucher may be worth $1,200, but we also have to factor in utilities. Your utility allowance is based on the size of your voucher. So if you have a two bedroom voucher, we're gonna automatically tell you you need to, uh, to subtract about $150 from the value of the voucher. So even though your voucher is $1,200, you basically only have about 1050 to work with as far as what the rent can be. Because again, um, that utility allowance, even though we're taking it away from the voucher, we're also taking it away from what their portion of rent would be once we get to the rent capital. So Leanne, I think, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, we, um, I have somebody asking, where do you usually get your comparable info from? But you said Zillow and another rental listing provider. So that's where the information is coming from. Correct. We could either use Red, I mean, we're, we're not limited to, um, to what we can look for. But again, we only have, um, you know, because we're not realtors, we can't go in and pull the MRIS to look to see what um, other units are uh, renting out for, for that. So we're basically uh, looking at all of the same websites that the general public has not has access to. All right, so there's lots of questions in the, the chat, so please don't think I'm ignoring you. I'm trying to keep in the same thread, but I will get back to the ones that were about inspections when we move on to that. So another question about how the vouchers are calculated. Are utilities factored in for all vouchers? I've had clients tell me that it is based on income. Uh, utility allowance is not income based. The utility allowance is based on the size of the voucher and the type of the unit. Each utility allowance is based on what we call exposed walls. The more walls that you have in a particular unit that are exposed to the outer elements, um, the higher the utility allowance is going to be. So if you're an apartment could actually have one, two, or three exposed walls depending on the structure of the building. A townhouse is going to have either two or three exposed walls. An end unit is going to have three. It's got the front, the side, and the back. A center a townhouse unit is going to just have the front and the back exposed. So a single family home is going to have four exposed walls. All four outer walls are exposed to the, uh, the outside. So again, the more exposure you have to the elements, the, um, the more drastic your heating and cooling bills are going to be, so the higher the utility allowance. Utility allowance is not income based. The rent is income based. The rent portion that the client pays is income based. Um, so another follow-up question to the voucher calculation is, is the voucher amount based on the number of people in the household? Yes, yeah, uh, per Virginia housing, it is one bedroom per two family members, regardless of age and sex. And the reason that they can put that limitation is because every room in your house, with the exception of your bathroom and your kitchen, is considered a sleeping room. So it's perfectly um, within HUD policies for people to be sleeping on the couch or sleeping in the den or anywhere else you choose to sleep in. But it is one bedroom per two family members. Now for those participants that have a disability, um, they can request what's called a reasonable accommodation for a larger voucher size that has to be submitted to VH for approval because they are the public housing authority. We're just the local housing office. Okay. Um, and then, so, and uh, forgive me, I don't know everybody's familiarity with the program overall. So I am gonna ask, um, somebody asked the paperwork that they filled out uh, requires you to provide three rented comparables that are rented in the last six months. So if I'm a property manager who's new to this, I've never used the program before, what is the obligation for the, the property manager and the property owner they're, they're representing. How does the process look different from if I'm just renting to a regular market rate tenant? Okay, um, some of the, um, the differences are, are not, well, there aren't really that many differences, um, except that you have to get a you know, pre approval through our office as far as the eligibility of the client for the unit, um, you know, again, it has to be within their voucher payment standard. Um, they are not allowed to pay the difference if they go over their, their amount unless they income qualify, which is also another worksheet that we do. Um, it does have to be inspected. Um, you know, a lot of people that are renting properties to anybody that doesn't have a voucher, the inspection is basically between the tenant and the landlord. And that's more or less a walkthrough and not an inspection to make sure that uh, that the toilet is, is secure to the floor. 
that there are no leaks anywhere um, in your tub, that um, the electricity, all of your outlets are working. There are light bulbs in every socket. Um, now, in, um, say you have a ceiling fan that has four light, individual light fixtures in it. Uh, as long as one of those, one of those, I guess a socket, as long as one of those sockets is working, as long as you have four light bulbs in it and one of those lights up, that's going to pass out of inspection. Okay, because lighting is available. Um, now, whether somebody who does not have a doctor is willing to accept that in a unit, you know, that's between them. But uh, it's between the tenant and the landlord, um, all aspects of the lease. We are not property management. We do not get involved in tenant landlord issues. Uh, we just basically make sure that the unit is up to HUD standards for uh, what they call HQS, housing quality standards, and that the client or our, our land our, our client, uh, your tenant, our client, um, that they remain income eligible for the program. So it, it is up to the property manager or the owner, landlord, whatever, to make sure that this uh, tenant is abiding by the terms of their lease. Um, one more question related to the actual um, size of the voucher. So somebody said, so the number of bedrooms and total rent are not related. I'm not sure I understand the question. I think what she's referring to is when we were talking about any anything but the bathroom and the kitchen are considered sleeping quarters. So mm -hmm. you could have a two bedroom that might be a higher rent value because it has more, or I guess that's not the right the right way to look at it, but you're not you're not getting a voucher based on you need three bedrooms. You're getting a voucher based on how many people, and you don't have to rent the equivalent number of bedrooms. Correct, correct. And if you um, if you just because you have a two bedroom voucher doesn't mean you can only rent a two bedroom unit. You can you you can find or rent whatever unit you choose to as long as again you you don't go over your voucher payment standard once utilities are factored in unless you income qualify to go over. Dawn, I'm going to kick it to you if you have a further follow-up. You're muted, Dawn. Okay, thanks. I appreciate it. I, I'm the one who's asking that question because I just want to get a little bit of clarity because it does get confusing when folks come in and say, um, my client has, you know, because I typically hear from realtors. I don't um, deal directly with the tenants. And they'll say, my client has a two-bedroom voucher or a three-bedroom voucher. And they're applying for a home that rent is, let's say, eighteen hundred a month. How do I know that that two-bedroom voucher qualifies them for eighteen hundred dollars a month? That's why I'm saying, is there a difference between? I mean, what do we look at when we're trying to pre-qualify whether or not they're going to be able to afford that rental? You know, because when they say I have a two-bedroom or a three-bedroom, I don't know how to quantify that for the rent I'm asking for. Okay, totally understood, and, and that's a really, really good question. We actually have um, what's called a voucher payment sheet, and I guess I should say that HUD has determined us back in August of 2018 that we're considered a small area. So voucher payment standards in this area really, 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 the, the value dropped quite a bit. Like for the city of Fredericksburg, went from $1,700 to a little over $1,200. Okay, there is a voucher payment standard sheet and a small area voucher payment standard sheet or a form of chart that's available on uh, vhda.com. Uh, once a participant uh, approaches you, you can always um, reach out to whoever the agent is and ask at that point. We do have the charts here as well that we could let you know what they're looking at. But I can tell you that if, um, if you have a five bedroom house that you're trying to rent and the participant has a two bedroom voucher, chances are they are not gonna qualify for that unit. Um, the only thing that you can do is um, complete the paperwork that they have submitted to you, um, which is called a request for tenancy approval. We call it an RTA, you may be called a RAPTA. Um, is to just complete that and turn it in. At that point, we can determine whether or not they're, they're gonna be eligible because some of our participants do have substantial income. They may qualify, even though they have a one or two bedroom house, they may qualify for a three or four bedroom uh, unit. It just really depends on what the rent is and what their income is. So- I have a, Can I say something about that? Because I have a concern with that regarding, you know, for us to complete the paperwork for the prospect to turn into their caseworker to see if they're eligible, it's requiring a landlord signature, which is that binding the, I'm, a, I'm assuming that that's binding the landlord to go into lease with them then. 
regardless. No, no, no the, the RTA, even though there is a signature on it, what that signature does is certify that the information that you're putting on there is complete uh, and that it's accurate to the best of your knowledge. The lease is a binding contract between you and the tenant, and there's is what we call the HAP contract, housing assistance payments contract. That's the binding document between the landlord, property owner, and um, the Virginia House. So that does not happen until after the inspection is passed and you get signed lease. That's when you sign the HAP contract. When you sign the lease and the HAP contract, that's the binding document or the binding uh, contract. Thanks. Okay, we've got lots and lots of questions. I'm gonna to try to keep on the thread that we're on. Still talking about payments. I had an, a, um, a manager who says we were told it is illegal for the tenant to pay any difference between the rent and voucher. How do we know when it's okay? Um, basically, the agent's gonna let you know you're gonna be mailed what's called a notice of rent amount that tells you what the tenant portion is supposed to be. Now, the tenant portion can change any time between the year as their income changes, uh, because again, the rent is income-based. So, for example, we'll, we'll use round numbers again. $1,200 is the contract rent. The tenant's portion is $200. VH pays the other $800. I'm sorry, $1,000, so <laughs> that makes it $1,200. Okay, the, we'll say the participant, um, they have a decrease, so now their portion of rent has dropped down to only $100. So on the flip side, Virginia Housing's payment is going to increase to $1,100, so the landlord is always going to be guaranteed at least their contract rent. But it is up to them to make sure that the tenant is paying their portion if they have. Okay. Uh, I'm going to jump back to one more question on renewals. Um, when doing renewals, do you just need an email saying they are renewing for how long and if there's an increase, or do you need a copy of an unsigned lease when doing a renewal? Okay, again, it really depends on what the, the procedures are for the particular property manager or office. Um, we can use an email um, or we can use a new lease. A new lease is always going to require a new housing assistance payments contract. But that doesn't matter. You know, we do whatever we need to do or you can send us what they call a, um, a lease renewal. A lot of uh, complexes have a little sheet that says the, what the renewal is, um, when it's gonna be effective, when the, uh, what the rent portion is going to be if there's a change in the rent. So we, we can use an email or we can use the form. We do prefer the form that the tenant has signed because that way we know that the tenant is aware that there is gonna change. But again, it is not mandatory. Okay. So we're going to switch to inspections a little bit. Um, somebody asked, how long does it take to get approved? Okay, normally, um, under, I'll say under normal circumstances, HUD allows us two weeks from the, what we call the ready date um, on the, uh, the RAFTA, or uh, one, once we actually receive the RAFTA. If the, uh, the request for tenancy approval reflects that the unit is ready for inspection right away, um, sometimes it's going to take us a day or two because of the, um, the amount of clients that we have to actually get that process. Once it goes in the system, we have two weeks from that date. Right now with COVID, the only inspections that we are doing are initial inspections, so they are not taking that long. Okay, and then in a, in a non-COVID time, how frequently <laughs> do you inspect properties? Daily. Um, I mean, we, we have over 1,500 clients here. Um, we are normally, uh, under normal circumstances, we do annual inspections. Every unit has to be reinspected annually to ensure that it is still up to HQS, which is housing quality standards. Um, and it, depending on how many people are moving, um, we have uh, clients that are, or not clients, I'm sorry, agents that are actually processing right now, even under COVID, uh, 15 to 20 moves. Um, and we have 10 agents. So that's a lot of moves. That's a lot of moves that are going on. So, um, you know, we, we do the best we can with what we got. Um, you know, so normally, again, very, very, very seldom does it take two weeks to get inspected. But, you know, sometimes under normal circumstances, it is going to. Um, if the unit fails, then we'll come out a second go round, which means an additional inspection. If it does not pass the second inspection, then the client will not be able to move into that unit. We're basically only giving you two chances. Okay. 
This is kind of a two part question. What are the guidelines for inspection, safety and habitability? And how do you all handle any sort of tenant complaints you get about a property once they've moved in? Well, um, again, if, if depending on what the complaint is, the lease is between the, the tenant and the landlord. If it's lease, lease issues, then this is something that they need to work out between them. If there is a um, an issue, say the air conditioner breaks or whatever, the, the tenant's supposed to, of course, per the lease, supposed to reach out and let the landlord know. Um, the landlord should be fixing that air conditioning unit. Um, if they don't, the tenant can come back to us and say, hey, um, I, I've told my landlord that my AC is not working and they're not doing anything about it. At that point, we could do, under normal circumstances, what's called a special inspection. If the unit, we go out and find that the AC is not working in the unit, then um, we can, we're going to give you 25 days to fix the issue. If it's not fixed, then we are going to abate your payment, which means you're not going to get it from the HDA or from Virginia Housing, I'm sorry. The, top, the client or the tenant still has to pay their portion, but Virginia Housing is not going to until it is compliant. If it's an issue of or the tenant has not paid their rent, um, it's up to the landlord to make sure that they're abiding by the terms of the lease, five-day pay or quit, and eviction if it comes down to that. Okay, and that brings up a follow-up question in here. So um, if there is a situation where someone is evicted, um, or is, you know, it needs to be removed from the property for violations of other terms of the lease. How does that work with you all? Um, if the person, right, so when they, per, how does it work with the pursuing an eviction? Okay, uh, the eviction gotcha. is 100% up to the landlord. Um, you know, again, the lease is between the tenant and the landlord. If the tenant is evicted from the property, then their housing assistance is in jeopardy. Um, that says that they're evicted, then, then we should terminate their assistance. But again, the eviction process is 100% up to the landlord because it's their property. And then I'm assuming if the landlord is, um, decides not to renew, they do not renew the lease, then your, your commitment to that payment would end with the initial contract. So if somebody right. did not renew, but the tenant did not vacate the property, you would not continue paying their por your portion of the rent. Well, that, that really depends because um, according to HUD, as long as the tenant is living in the unit, then HUD is responsible for um, their portion of rent on that unit. Now, we are going to send, once we get a notice to vacate or even a notice from the landlord that says, hey, we're evicting this person, this is the court date. Um, and again, I'm not really up on evictions because that's not my bailiwick. But you know, once we find out that the, that the tenant is no longer in the unit because maybe the sheriff has come and removed them or whatever, um, we're not going to pay. But HUD says that they're in the unit on the first of the month that the landlord is due rent for the month. Okay. Which again, is how come we can make all of our move outs effective on the 31st of the month because we're not going to pay a landlord for a unit or for a tenant that's moving out on the first. In a situation like that, uh, it's really, really dicey. Technically, the, uh, the tenant should be paying. HUD says if the client's in the unit on the first of the month, that HUD will pay. So, um, you know, again, we do everything we can to ensure that, that I don't want to say that we're, I don't want to worry this. We are encouraging our tenants to move out no later than the 31st of the month. But again, ultimately, it is up to the landlord, property manager, the owner. To, um, to go through with the eviction process if it comes down to that. Okay. I um, had a question of where they can find the renewal form. Where do they get the renewal form from? Um, that I'm really not sure. Um, yeah, it could be, um, I, don't, I don't know if you have sister properties where you can see what they're using. Um, you can basically create your own. Um, we've had some landlords that just basically type a paragraph that says, um, that we're renewing the lease for one year, all the, you know, all the provisions from the initial lease remain intact, new dates are from this to this, new rent is this, and, and that's fine. So it, this is just me, and tell me if I'm wrong, but it seems like maybe we're overthinking this. You have lease renewals for all of your tenants, so maybe you'd follow the same process as for any of your tenants, whatever your renewal process is, if you choose to renew with this client, you would do the regular renewal process, then you would get whatever paperwork follows. There is no standard renewal form through HUD. Correct. Okay. 
Okay, I got a lot of questions and sifting through here. Um, what is the timeline for consumers porting into the area to obtain appointment with the housing staff? How long does it take to get that initial appointment? Well, right now we are closed to the public. We are not meeting anybody. Everything's being done by mail or email. Um, with portability, um, it gets kind of kind of really sticky. Uh, we get clients all the time that are saying, well, you received my paperwork when no, we have not. Um, once we get a portability packet, there is paperwork that is done between the agencies, the receiving public housing authority and, and the sending public housing authority. Um, there's paperwork that has to be done back and forth between that. So depending on how quickly uh, that paperwork is done, it would determine how long the process takes for portability. We've seen too many times where an agency says we sent the paperwork, we have not received it, and the tenant is already here, and they're basically banging on our door saying, why do you, why, you've got my paperwork, why am I not getting, you know, why, why are we not moving ahead? And it's because we don't have all of the paperwork. And a lot of agencies also are post-dating a voucher. We can't, there's nothing we can do for anybody until we have a, an, an active voucher. Right now, I have a woman that's trying to move here from Florida, and she has been in the move process now for a month and a half. Her voucher is not even effective until October 1st. So because we don't have an active voucher for her, there's nothing we can do for her, and it's, it's, it, it's out of our hands. So there are a lot, of, a lot of things are going to determine how long that portability takes. We tell everybody to allow at least 60 days. And Leanne, I might need to have you clarify this one, but um, we've run into situations where housing staff have not been willing to provide info to property managers due to privacy issues. Is there a release they can sign authorizing the exchange of information between housing staff and agents? I guess I'm, I'm not clear what information that is that's, that's vital to, that wouldn't be part of the application or the lease documentation. It, it was yeah. just a matter of trying to figure out <clears throat> Um, whether they actually had a voucher and, and were participating in the program, the, the property manager couldn't even get that information. Okay, um, well, we can not tell you if they have a voucher. Um, if, if they have, um, if they are a participant in the voucher program and have been approved to move, they're going to have a paper voucher that they can show you that has an issue date and a, um, an expiration date. And it should also reflect that that voucher has been issued by uh, Virginia House. So it, it is up to the client to provide you with that information that they are a participant on the program should they wish to rent your property. We, we cannot confirm or deny participation for anybody on the program. Can I ask a backup question to that? Um, so if they have the paperwork, does the paper uh, also show the amount of the voucher and the amount that they're responsible for because that's the situation that we ran into. Okay, now that, um, there are a lot of things that could possibly delay that as well. Um, number one, just because we have a voucher um, doesn't always mean that the participant has given us all the paperwork we need to uh, calculate their rent accordingly. There is a small formula that we can do, but I can tell you that uh, we cannot guarantee that the rent that that calculation is going to give us is going to be accurate um, because there are a lot of things that could change that amount. Um, the RTA could come into us where it states that it's one exposed wall. When our inspector actually gets out there, it's three exposed walls. So therefore, the uh, rent calculation that's been pre-done is incorrect because the utility allowance is incorrect. So, you know, there are going to be times we know we're not going to be able to give you that amount, and then there are going to be times we can give you an amount, but we, we're not going to be able to guarantee that it's accurate until we get the paperwork back on, from the inspection. Okay, we had one more follow-up question to the renting above what the voucher is. Um, so if they have a two-bedroom voucher and they want a more expensive four-bedroom, and say they will pay the difference, then this is okay? No, it is not. Um, the only time that a voucher participant is able to go over their voucher payment standard is if we determine by filling out a worksheet that we've been provided by Virginia Housing, that we have determined that they income qualifies to pay that difference. That difference, um, you may remember earlier, I was telling you that most participants pay 30% of their adjusted monthly income. 
this worksheet allows us to see if they can afford to pay 40% of their adjusted monthly income. So just because they want it and tell you, yeah, I can pay the difference, no, they cannot, it's a policy violation. Um, it can also um, result in both tenant and landlord being uh, disbarred from being able to participate in the program. It's called side payments, and side payments are a program violation. Okay. So I think we're kind of getting to the crux of what is concerning to property managers and homeowners. This question follow up is how are we supposed to qualify the applicant on income if you can't provide the voucher amount? So it seems like it needs to be, it's a longer process for qualification, whereas you have someone who'd walk in the door off the street and doesn't have a voucher, you'd quickly be able to look at their income and say if they can qualify. On the voucher, they really need to come out and do the inspection first before they can adequately determine the total cost of that voucher? Um, not always. Um, I don't want to backtrack. The utility allowance, you know, again, sometimes we get, when we get the request for tenancy approval, the information on the, uh, that document is not correct, which could alter their amount. Um, the chart back to the end, I think I didn't answer all of your question when you asked earlier about um, the amounts. We're giving the tenants, when we give them their voucher, they get paperwork for the landlord, they're also getting that voucher payment standard chart. That same chart is also available on uh, virginiahousing.com. So if they're telling you they have a voucher, um, a two bedroom voucher, you can always ask them, do you have the voucher payment standard chart? Or you can go online and look on virginiahousing.com to see what the, Virginia, the, um, the voucher payment standard is for that particular area. Now, because we do fall under what's called small area, I'm sorry, small area voucher payment standards, um, you know, again, they are going to be smaller than some others. So there's two charts, small, the SAVPS, which is small area voucher payment standards, and EPS. Very, very important that you're looking at the correct chart. Okay, so you're using that as a guide to start. And Correct. seeing if the rent is even in the ballpark of what you think they'd qualify for. And if it's not, then that's not a place that this, per this individual can afford. So you're not really waiting for that final determination. You can look in advance to see if it's within the ballpark. Okay. Yes. Yeah. The, the, uh, the information is available. Yeah. So you've gotten a couple of questions. Um, I know deal working with CVHC, I've worked with you all for 10 years now. The, the voucher program, how long is the waiting list? Are you accepting new people? <laughs> No, we are not, and to be honest, we probably won't be for quite some time. Um, our waiting list uh, probably has close to 500 people on it. Um, the issue is that because HUD says we cannot deny affordability as long as the funding is there, we have so many people that are going uh, to other areas, getting a voucher, and then bringing it back here. So what that's resulting in is us being over-leased in this area, um, the only time we're able to open up our waiting list is if we are under these, meaning we're not hitting the percentages. We, we are usually right around 112 to 114 percent um, as far as leasing goes. So okay. with that, we probably will not be opening our waiting list anytime soon. Okay. Um, question about income requirements. Can you require the participant to meet your in-house income requirement per application guidelines? Um, although we do have income limits, there is no income requirement. So I'm not sure how to answer that question. But from a tenant screening perspective, you can use your own screening criteria. However, it, with source of income, if your homeowner owns more than four properties, you cannot discriminate against that source of income. You cannot disqualify someone solely from the fact that part of their income source is a housing voucher. Does that make sense? Right, John? Am I saying that correctly? If they have four or less properties, they are allowed to say, I am not comfortable renting to a voucher holder. But if you represent someone who has 10 townhouses, you can use your income criteria, but that income counts towards that calculation. I'm not sure who you're directing that question to that is not. I'm just stating, yeah, it. I'm just stating. <laughs> but this is new for us. It just passed July 1. Um, and it is a little bit confusing because the source of income rules are different than the regular fair housing application. 
So I think people sometimes get confused. Just I, I know I get confused looking at it. How many houses is it? Does it apply to property managers? Is it just for owners? So uh, I know we've, we've got some questions out of our, our last fair housing class about that. So I just wanna be very clear. It's, if you have more than four properties, you cannot discriminate solely based on source of income. You do not have to change your rental criteria, but you must count that income just as any other income. Um, somebody asked if you can evict for issues other than non-payment of rent. Yes, right, if there's lease violations, you know, extra people in the house, you know, noise violations, things like that, I'm sure that you're able to do that. Right. Um, let's see. Are you requ required to allow anyone with a voucher to port into the area? Yes. Uh, as long as funding is available, yes. All right, there's a, kind of a long one here. Um, I think this is more of a comment. Let's see, Some, so many people who rent their home state no vouchers allowed. Many times that is because agents either don't know anything about the program and how landlords can get approved or because they have heard they shouldn't ad advise the landlords to accept them. How can the Housing Coalition advertise its services to agents and new landlords who'd like to know more about the program? And, and frankly, Shay, I know that you're fairly new to our call, but I mean, we've been doing this for years and Don and the other folks who have been on this. We have, at least once a year, we bring in some nonprofit. It doesn't necessarily CVHC and it's not necessarily the Housing Choice Voucher Program, but I'll say from a FAR perspective, I think for a lot of the general public, they lump any government assistance kind of in the same bucket. So we've had the folks um, from the COC come in and talk about rapid rehousing funds, um, the housing locator program. So we are trying to get that word out there. We've even done a testimonial with one of our own realtors, Clay Mahulity is a Chrismar, who has been renting using not the voucher program, but a rapid rehousing program, which is a, you know, a similar kind of setup. Um, we've, we've done a testimonial video with him. So we're, we're trying to get that information out there and in terms of CVHC reaching out, what kind of outreach do y'all try to do to you know, recruit more landlords to your Question. program? Not necessarily your program, but you know, touch base with landlords that might have properties that would be a, you know, appropriate for your voucher holders. The right size, close into town. I know when we work with the, um, the other nonprofits, you know, they really are looking for properties that are closer in um, so people can, you know, utilize public transportation and access to job centers. So we, we've tried to work with them to get some outreach to this group. Um, but I know it, it is a challenge. Well, the Housing Choice Voucher Program needs to uh, monthly have a landlord briefing. Um, and landlords would be invited to attend that. Uh, that's generally posted on our website. Since COVID, we're not doing that in person. Um, and the other issue is, is that insofar as the Housing Counseling Department, we've also provided um, several opportunities for fair housing. So, you know, right now, since we're not meeting with the public, everything's being done either by Zoom or, or some other um, effort. Um, you have generally just visiting our website, you can get more information. And all the staff is listed on our website, so you can always reach out. And certainly you can reach out to me if you're not sure, um, you know, who you might need to talk to about any service we might provide. Um, question of, are agents allowed to attend the landlord training? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it, it's, um, it is available for anybody. So perhaps we all are back up and running and we're in person again, maybe we can catch base and if you have another landlord training we can send that out to anybody who's interested um we did have a question go ahead sorry i was going to say we do have the uh, the landlord briefing powerpoint if anybody wants it um i don't know if you want to jot down my email address you can email me and i can, will gladly send it to you it is the presentation that we use for the landlord briefing and there's all kinds of information in there about the program as well yeah why don't so, you give me that email address and i'll pop it in the chat so everyone can see it go ahead it's B as in Betty Newberry, N E W B E R R Y, at centralvahousing.org. Okay, I'll put that in the chat, everybody. Um, so I know that the, the million dollar question here we got is any way to help find rentals for clients? I know that's such a challenge. We've got folks from First Choice, Leanne and Shay, we talk about this a lot. It's not easy to find rentals, and that's that's what's so challenging. And really, the program and and correct me if I'm wrong, 
the Housing Choice Voucher Program does not have a case management aspect to it. You are administering the voucher and facilitating that. You're not visiting them on a regular basis, making sure they're going to whatever, you know, their job seeking, some, like some of the other programs have an intensive case management perspective. Yours doesn't. So this, these tenants are responsible for finding their own housing. Correct. Yeah, and their own resources for whatever else they may, may need. You know, a lot of times um, we are um, mistaken for being social workers, and we are not. Uh, our main focus is making sure that the renters do, or I'm sorry, not the renters, that our participants do remain income eligible for the program. Okay, and Don had a thank you, Don, for point of order here. It's not income criteria; it's your approval criteria. Obviously, you have other things in your approval criteria, and you, you at the law did not change your ability <coughs> to apply your own tenant screening criteria. You know, um, needs to be consistent. Um, we definitely had this talk with Aaron Barton last month. You can't have diff varying sets of income criteria for different properties and different landlords. It needs to be consistent, but you do not need to alter your rental criteria. Um, all right. Did I miss anybody who has a burning question? They were kind of flying in fast and furious. I tried to get as many as I could. <coughs> How many properties do you have that accept the voucher? How many people do you have looking for a property? So I guess how many vouchers do you all administer at this point? Do you have a number or is that ever changing? Um, right now we have over 1,500 vouchers. Oh, wow. And yes, it is ever changing. And basically the reason for that is because of the ports or transfers <clears throat> coming into our area. Do you have a ballpark on how many people are actively looking right now with for a voucher? No. Okay. I think I think that's a a good question, but I don't have the ability to answer that. Yeah, that, that changes daily. <clears throat> yeah. I mean every day we're getting vacate notes. Okay. Um, um, so um, we have a, a comment that says the coalition used to have a book of available properties where landlords could provide their listing. Has that stopped? That because we're not open to the public um, and we're processing paperwork through email, Dropbox, uh, fax machine, the <clears throat> landlords have not been dropping that kind of information by our office. And the tenants are not coming in to look at it because we're not accepting, you know, one-on-one -on -one, uh, intake. Okay, but on that note, we do have um, VHEA or social services. There is a website, virginiahousingsearch.com. It's free to list your properties there. Um, we wish we could get more landlords to advertise their vacancies on that website. <clears throat> So if you do yeah. have any vacancies, uh, virginiahousingsearch.com is the place to go to list it. Okay. All right, virginiahousingsearch.com. Yes, ma'am. All right, I'll pop it in there. <clears throat> Kim, I'm going to do... I know, you have a hard stop of 10. So thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for organizing this. And Betty, Betty oh my gosh, thank you. No, no problem. <laughs> Betty and... Um, Maggie, you're still here. I just have to get set up for another webinar. I appreciate it. I know that's how it goes these days. Thank you, Dee, so much. So, ladies, you've been amazing. This is great, great information. Um, before we let them, the other, Maggie and Betty go, are there any burning questions I did not get to? Please unmute yourself if you want to just ask um, or pop it in the chat if I missed you. I had a question. Um, they said something about um, them not paying their portion of the rent when and the tenant pays their 20 percent what mm -hmm. how does that reflect on the tenant when the landlord's not ex getting their part of the rent does does that qualify for an eviction for the tenant and does when it's gone to court does that apply to the tenant that they didn't pay their part do you understand what I'm saying there? It, it sounds like that's like a dual type question. Um, if we are abating your property, meaning that we're not paying, it's because the unit does not fall under housing quality standards, uh, according to the company. Um, the tenant is not responsible for that portion of rent, nor can you recoup rent for any time that the unit is not 
um, considered compliant, program compliant. You cannot evict the tenant for any portion that the HDA would normally pay. So my recommendation there, the only time we're gonna abate a property is if you're not fixing the property to make it suitable for your tenant. <clears throat> so again, you know, the, the landlord does have a responsibility there to make sure that the unit is what the tenant is paying for, you know, for the, well, between the tenant and um, the Virginia housing or HUD. Um, so, you know, again, it's the tenant or landlord's responsibility to make sure that they are making sure the unit is suitable for the tenant. So okay. when you when you decide to accept this voucher, you're entering into a contract that you're going to keep that home to a certain level. If you do not, and that's what results in non-payment of rent from the HUD side, I do not see that being an ev evictable offense. Right. Like if and that were to go in front of a judge, you would not win that. Yeah. And once the unit is in compliance, then we're going to we're going to restart the payments. So it's not like they're going to live there forever and not. Um, we did not have to pay rent. Um, when Once you get into the second month of abatement, the tenant has to move. We will not allow the tenant to remain in the unit beyond that. So my apologies for not mentioning that to you sooner, but we're not gonna allow the tenant to remain in a property that is not compliant. Now, in, the, the, contract. in uh, the paperwork uh, of the voucher for the landlord, is that is that indicated that if you do not keep the property up to the standards of the inspection, you could lose that portion and it's not regainable until you apply? Yes, it is in the housing assistance payments contract that you will be getting a copy of to read before you sign. Okay, once, thank you. Once you sign that document, then you are bound by those provisions. Thank you. <laughs> thank can, you. I, can I flip the script on that? So just like not all landlords are the same, not all tenants are the same. And I've right. been in homes where landlords have done a bang up job and had to, you know, practically redo the homes from year to year because the damage that the tenants did was so great. Um, my understanding is that, that, that there's a, for lack of a better way to say it, th say it three strike and you're out rule for tenants. What kind of violations result in tenants being put in jeopardy of losing their vouchers? Um, multiple, there's actually what we call a family obligations notice. It is a mandatory document that the, the family has to sign, all, all household members, that state that, um, that they are aware that they have to keep the house um, that they are renting um, uh, compliant with the housing quality standards. So if there is an issue that the tenant has caused, um, ultimately it's going to be the landlord's responsibility to fix it, but they can definitely charge the tenant for the cost of those repairs. Now, a lot of times, um, and we see this so, so many times, landlords assume that we are taking full responsibility for this tenant's <clears throat> residency history. We do not. We strongly encourage that you screen all of your tenants. Um, we want you to do regular inspections. We're going to come and inspect the unit before the client is allowed to move in. We're not coming back for a year. A lot of things can happen in a year. Put it in your lease that you're gonna do regular inspections. Most, I think even the Virginia residential tenant landlord lease um, states in their access to premises. So do your own inspections. If you start seeing things that are <clears throat> indicating that this person is not taking good care of your property, then you need to address it with them then. Don't wait a year when you have the potential to have thousands of dollars of repairs. If they're not abiding by that lease, by keeping that property um, safe, sanitary, clean, the lawn, the grass mowed, whatever, um, all that is covered in your lease. So they, they either abide by the lease or you evict them. So don't let it get to the point where it costs you thousands and thousands of dollars. I have re recommended to a bunch of landlords that you put in your lease that the landlord's gonna take responsibility for changing the filters. Number one, you know, they're getting changed on a regular basis. Number two, it gets your foot in the door on a regular basis to see what's happening in those properties. At so least quarterly. Yeah, so protect yourself. Yeah, protect your investment. Um, okay, couple questions. Does the coalition provide rental history? No. 
Yeah. No, that that actually is considered confidential. We can provide you with previous landlord contact information for you to call that landlord if they'll get it to you. Then that's you know just your regular reference, but we cannot give rental history. We don't know what a lot of rental history is because a lot of times we don't know. Um, unfortunately, there are landlords that are going to rent to somebody. They don't check references. The property may have some damages. When it's time for the tenant to move, that landlord said, oh, well, you know, I, I got paid. I don't care. Um, that doesn't do anybody any favors. So. Um, you, sort of yeah. a follow-up. Um, should the counselor, I don't know if every housing voucher holder is assigned a counselor, but should CVHC be advised of a situation with violations in the lease? Um, does that okay. jeopardize yeah. this voucher? Yeah. Yes, because lease violations are also program violations. Now, we can't do anything to uphold your lease, but we can definitely hold them accountable for program violations. Okay. Um, if that makes any sense. I know it's a real, real fine line. Yeah. Is, is there a form is that a, a HUD form that you use to report to the Housing Coalition um, what the violations are? Well, um, you can actually do what we call like a 2130, and this is more in the realty world than what I do because I'm on the administrative end and not the rental side. Um, but there's what's called a 2130. You have 21 days to correct the issue or you need about 30 days from the date of the letter. Um, all you have to do is notify the client that you've noticed this lease violation and just send a copy to the agent. So <clears throat> although we can't disclose information in the file, we can use that information in the file for whatever disciplinary action we need to take on our end, um, program-wise, up to um, termination of their time. I guess that's sort of a follow-on, is how exactly are, are they held accountable? Um, and a lot of times, um, because the program does allow them more than one opportunity, um, what we're doing is basically compiling um, information, and once we have what is considered um, repeated or serious lease violation, then they, they lose their housing system. Okay. And as you know, with our waiting list being closed, they're not going to get back on waiting list when there. Cool. We have made Miss Betty here talk for a whole hour, so I'm going to wrap up with just <laughs> one question confirmation. The security deposit. You do not pay the security deposit. The tenant is responsible for their own, correct? 100% responsible, yes. The and they're required to pay the full amount, whatever is required on that unit. Um, we, we have nothing to do with that part of it, um, but I would encourage you, yes, 100 you, If you don't have a security deposit, then, then don't let me in. Um, we've seen a lot of times before where um, a participant will go into a rental or, or a security deposit uh, repayment agreement where the, the owner or landlord may say, okay, we'll give you $200 now, $200 a month till it's done. Once they're in, we've seen it happen a few times, then you no longer get that money. Where are they getting it from? Their rent is already income based. Um, and we use gross rent, not their net. So. Um, they sh they're not going to have that extra money to give you towards that security deposit every month. So if you don't have that security deposit, then, then I would suggest that you move on to the next tenant. Okay. All right, well, this has been so informative. Thank you so much. I know it's a lot to talk for an hour straight. We really appreciate your willingness to share about the program um, and to give us such great information.